Hello, plant people. How are you guys doing today? You can see by my hair, wasn't ready to film today. However, my DMs decided to fill up very quickly today after Canadian Prepper released a video about how our seeds are going to be outlawed. So I'm going to review the video and let's talk about whether or not he's on track or if he's fear-mongering just a little bit. So if you are not familiar with who Canadian Prepper is, he's a YouTuber, pretty big actually. He's located in Saskatchewan. I'm not gonna say specifically where he's located, but he's in and around the same city as me. And his titles and thumbnails are usually very scary sounding. However, the results in the video are actually pretty level headed all in all. So his latest video was on garden seeds and how we need to stock up now before it becomes illegal. So the premise to the story is that the seeds are going to run out and they're gonna try to starve us out even if we do try to garden. So we're gonna talk about whether or not what he's saying is valid. And then he goes into a little bit about uh, freezing seeds or putting seeds in the freezer and that being a way to store them. And we'll talk about whether or not that is viable as well. But we're gonna do the exact same way we did the Kevin Epic Gardening no-till garden type format. We're gonna do the same thing here right now today. So let me first off get my handy dandy iPad up in up and running so that we can find this Canadian prepper video and record it. Oh, worth more than gold. Hi folks, Canadian Prepper here. So today we're gonna talk about something which is absolutely dirt cheap and affordable to everybody. I like how he says they're dirt cheap because we all know as gardeners how much it's gone up since the pandemic started. Because everyone in 2020 started getting into gardening and you just made it so much more expensive for us folk that have been gardening for years. Like getting is good, but when okay. the party stops and the music is over, is going to be worth more than precious metals, worth more than gold, worth more than ammunition. It's going to be worth more than food itself. Let me tell you what it is. Let's get to it. Okay, guys, if you're like me, you wake up every other night and ask yourself, why are they stockpiling seeds? way in the arctic in a place they're calling the doomsday seed vault millions and millions of seeds over the past 15 years putting them in this place which is inaccessible to anybody that doesn't have a very large airplane i wonder why that could be okay so supposedly the global seed vault has been dubbed the doomsday vault this, of course, conjures up an image of a reserve of seeds for use in the case of an apocalyptic event or global catastrophe. Yes, but it is much smaller localized destruction of threats facing gene banks all over the world that the vault was designed to protect against, and that's why the vault was opened. Okay, well, if you believe that, then I got some beachfront property to sell you up here in the tundra. Let's get real, okay? If they really wanted to build a, a seed... So he's talking about uh, the seed vault, I believe that one is in Sweden, but there is multiple seed vaults all over the world, and there are three that are pretty much all of equal size, one of which is actually in our city, Canadian proper, just saying. Um, it's located at our university. I'm not gonna say specifically on the university where it is because I don't want any crazies going there, but um, I'm pretty sure you can do a tour of it if you ask nicely. And essentially it's underground. Um, it's in like bomb proof cement building. Um, the walls are like several feet thick. The glass in the building is supposed to be bulletproof. Like it is high, high, high security. Um, when you go in the building, I've been in there before, you have to like scan card in through every single hallway into every single room. So they know where you are at all times in the building. Um, but yeah, that's not just that one in Sweden that exists. There's one, there's three in particular that are very, very large. 
And uh, inside of these things, there's a few things going on, but we'll, we'll listen to what he has to say just a little bit more here about the seed vault before I elaborate too much on what I've seen inside the seed vaults here in North America, but I'll continue. Vault, which was accessible to all. Do you really think they would stick it where nobody could access it if it all went to hell? Come on, let's, let's get real. They're saying that, you know, it's a way they can maintain a constant temperature, even though the electricity... So with the one in, you have, Ella has lots to say about this too here today in this video. So when he's talking about um, it not being accessible to humans, there's a reason for that. So if you actually tour a seed vault, um, in particular the three biggest ones, they will right up front tell you that their locations are very specifically chosen based on environmental factors, such as they're not on fault lines, they're not near coastal regions, they're near areas that typically don't have extreme weather. They typically don't have extreme weather in these areas. And if anyone is from Saskatoon, you know how not extreme our weather can be for the most part. Um, we don't get tornadoes, we don't have earthquakes, we clearly do not have hurricanes, nothing like that. So that's actually why they're positioned in these really unique areas. That on top of the fact that they're usually located inside of countries, meaning if another country was to like come over and try to harm that seed vault, there would be a ton of tactics to subdue any sort of military operation and get to those seed vaults long before they could actually get there. So Canada, and the North American one, is located in Saskatoon, which is like right in the middle of nowhere <laughs> compared to the coastal regions and you know geographically the entire world so that's actually why the position is like that it's not in a remote area so that people can't access it it's well i guess technically it is but i mean saskatoon's is in the middle of saskatoon so he goes out but if the electricity is going to go out for that long doesn't that mean that we're probably in some sort of doomsday scenario i'm pretty sure if we have nuclear power uh, systems and hospitals that run on backups of power supplies or rely on those you think that they would uh, rely on the same thing for a, a seed vault i don't know seems kind of fishy to me it's got some great reset vibes you know it's got some agenda 21 vibes if i slap my tinfoil hat on for a second that's what i'd be thinking about this now I've always thought that the Doomsday Vault was just a little, little bit suspicious with respect to that, you know, because we're seeing a genetic and biodiversity decline around the world. And uh, this whole seed vault thing always struck me as a harbinger for like, what the heck are they preparing for? You know, maybe it's just uh, for their alien overlords who are going to come back to the planet and, and harvest all the genetic data or something. I'm totally kidding. I know some of you guys are going to run with that. You're going to take that sound bite. You're going to see, say, see, he's a nutter, yada, 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 let's get him canceled. But you're a nutter. I'm just joking. No, you're not. Um, I actually do enjoy your videos quite a bit. But he's talking about um, the gen genetic biodiversity being dwindled down in crops, and that's one of the purpose for the seed vaults. So the seed, seed vault that I know of, there's one at my university that I've been in several times to date and talked to the scientists that actually physically work there. Um, the purpose for it is to bank genetic information. Now, the reason for that is because of monocropping in particular in Canada, all over the world, we will monocrop with very specific species of say wheat or chickpeas or lentils, whatever the case is, because that is what the consumer wants, needs and purchases. That means due to that, the genetic diversity within that crop is less. So we have a seed vault that then carries all the genetic diversity from all the different strains of wheats and chickpeas and lentils and sunflowers, you name it, inside of the seed vault. And um, each seed packet has its own phenotypic description. And that means if our environment ever changed or if, um, even technology decided to change. So for example, 
um, as we've gotten smarter with farming and agriculture, we've realized that wheat, if it gets too tall, will lodge. If the heads get too heavy, it will lodge. And that just simply means it'll fall over. So we will go into the genetic seed bank as plant scientists, and we will pick out specific species that are maybe shorter in height, maybe the heads aren't as heavy, and so we can prevent lodging and therefore harvesting is much quicker, much more efficient, and our yields tend to be a little bit larger as well. So that's more so the purpose of the seed bank and the phenotypic bank, having a large range of that, because we never know what we're going to need per se. And um, we're using this technology and this information more and more every day. The more we start to understand things like snow capture on, say, an agricultural field and how um, thicker stubble or taller stubble will help with that. Well, we may genetically engineer a stubble that is maybe thicker, that can hold up against some snow and act as like a snow trap, things like that. So I'm not sure what agriculture is gonna look like 200 years from now, but I'm assuming that genetic data is gonna be incredibly valuable in making new hybridized versions of crops so that it fits our technological needs, maybe our fertilizer needs, maybe just our soil quality uh, needs as well. And we don't fully understand all these phenotypes yet, so new plant science research may yield results showing that say, certain types of wheat are more efficient with their nitrogen capture, for example. So maybe we want to integrate those species, whether they be ancient or not, into the actual new system. So let's continue. Besides this video, but seed vaults are not something which has to be reserved just for the elite who are going to escape through their five-star bunkers when it all hits the fan, which in fact they've been training to do for the last month or so. So you better prepare. Every gardener right now is like, yeah, we know you don't need a seed vault to do this. My closet is the seed vault. <laughs> oh, I've got so many seed packets. Or if you have one, for most people, if you're like me, that's going to be our basement. Unless you're lucky enough to go and check out Ron over at Atlas Survival Shelters, who can build you a real deal bunker. But today, we're talking about seeds. Seeds. So simple, right? Noob. Got one rubber made. Who is this guy? Incredibly simple. Now I am by no means an expert. I have a little garden that I do every year. I grow my- I'm like looking at the brands popping up and I'm like, you went to Canadian Tire and PB Mart. I know that much based on those brands. Potatoes, my carrots, my onions, my peas, my beans, you know, just a few little things, a few little odds and ends. I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna have to go visit Mr. Arcopia, Dean, uh, the guy who uh, has the uh, greenhouse, which can maintain a constant temperature at least while the sun is out in winter time without using any natural gas or other heating source. We're gonna go and have to talk to him because him and his wife are a bit of a green thumb and we're gonna have to ask them about what kind of seeds you should store, how you should store them. Now, I have a few tips. That Arcopia guy is in Saskatchewan as well. Very, very cool setup. I found an article. The article is called Gardening Know-How. Does freezing kill seeds? Information on using seeds that are frozen. Because the idea with the seed vault is, is that if you can maintain a constant temperature of, I think it's less than minus 10, and it has to be constant, and it has to be very low minus humidity. Five, so I you're think. definitely going to want to have, like what we have here, mylar bags, of course, right? Now, if you can maintain that environment, technically you can save these seeds for years, possibly decades. Now, the idea with any homesteader or self-reliant person is going to say, hey, you should be stockpiling seeds. You should be using those seeds and, you know, uh, replenishing and making new seeds every year. I get that. But not everybody has access to a garden. Not everybody has access to a plot of land. Some of you guys are living in apartment buildings. Some of you just might want some little thing that you can barter with when it all goes to hell. Because let's face it, things that are of high value and are highly dense and small and compactable and transferable, transportable, Things like that are hard to come by. That's why people use precious metals because they're rare, okay? They're very dense. They can't be uh, copied and, and fabricated. They're non-fungible. And they're basically something which, you know, can transfer value uh, across different countries. Doesn't matter where you are. Well, seeds are gonna be very similar. There's also things like over the counter. Now he's talking about like prepper stuff and I don't even know what exactly he's talking about. So that's good. Um, he made a comment there about how if we can just throw the seeds in the fridge or in the freezer 
for storage if we live in an apartment and we don't necessarily plant and then harvest and seed save. So two comments there. First off, the seed vaults aren't just cold freezers. They are cold freezers with incredibly low levels of humidity and the seeds themselves are stored in very airtight containers. And there's a reason for this. The first purpose of the freezing is to slow down enzymatic processes with inside of the seed where the starch is. The second purpose to the lack of humidity or reducing the humidity or keeping the humidity um, within a specific range is so that we don't dry out the starch too much, but we don't hydrate the starches too much as well. So there is a balance there, which if you've ever seen your deep freeze or the ice buildup on your deep freeze, it's very clearly not a moisture controlled environment. So technically, if we're looking to store seeds for decades in a freezer, you would have to have a sophisticated enough freezer where you would also be able to control the ambient humidity as well. And that's what these seed vaults do. So like for example, in um, Canada, the Canadian seed vault that we have here, it's underground and it's in under bomb proof cement and it's a pretty big underground maze and they have like these filing cabinets similar to like what you'd see in like the smithsonian mega or um smithsonian video captures where they're like they just have these rows and rows and rows of filing and so it's like um you push the rows aside and you can like walk down a tiny little aisle and then if someone could technically close you into that and that's how you get around. So it's an entire room of filing cabinets with just one single row to follow through and you have to like move each row over. So um, very, very full, but very, very controlled. Um, another thing to note is he is under the conception that the seed vault is a set it and forget it process, which it's not a set it and forget it process. There's humans that work at seed vaults, and I'm assuming the same thing's going on in the one in Sweden. If it's not happening in the one in Sweden, then the seeds are always being rotated out. And so say for example, and I'll just give you a scenario that I personally know happened at the seed vault here in my area and my university. So seeds get found in an Egyptian tomb and they're not sure if they're viable or not, but they want to check the genetic coding on them, the phenotypes of it, and just see specifically what this wheat does. So they take the grain out, they weigh the grain, and each one of the three major seed vaults and the scientists in them receive a package of the grain. The first thing they do is they slowly begin to rehydrate the seed so that it isn't rehydrated too quickly. So it goes moldy, but it's not done slowly. And so it is able to germinate. So they rehydrate it in a fashion that is sustainable for the seed to germinate with. And they immediately will germinate those seeds. Now they may do this in batches, just in case one batch goes awry, they may do this them all separately, but they will eventually germinate them. So once they germinate them, they go into a controlled, um, it kind of looks like a walk-in freezer, like a butcher freezer area kind of spooky actually. So if you go into the seed vaults, it's like the seeds are underneath in the basement and then there's like a second, maybe I shouldn't be saying this. There's another area in the building that's like a freezer type thing and there's just freezers all over the whole place and they're not actually freezers, they're grow rooms. And so inside of those, each pot gets planted with the plants. Each pot gets its own fertilizer um, and water. It gets air moving in and out. It gets lights on timers at specific um, UV, or sorry, at different radiation lengths. And then the master door is shut 
generally and locked tight. And then there's a viewing panel, which is like this little mini window that's also on a trap door that you can open and view the plants in, but they're typically grown in like this very secluded, untouched area. And the reason for that is to protect the plant because you don't know what that plant is susceptible to when it comes to diseases or pests or anything like that. And as a plant scientist, if you're working with, you know, a hundred different uh, walk-in freezers essentially of these plants growing you don't want to be transferring so your viewings and your observation recordings would come from like the visual window and then maybe the harvesting and the biomass stuff um measuring of the biomass and what's in the biomass would happen after but your visual phenotype typical um measurements would come from eye levels and usually they'll have like measuring tapes in the back and all that sort of fancy stuff so once those are fully planted and grown they're then harvested and they actually have hand threshers <laughs> i've used them they're like these little things you stick them in and they thresh your seed and they pop out into this little bag they're really cute um but you hand thresh everything and then you would you would save that product and then you may run another set of tests. Maybe you, you re-germinate and you build up your seed storage a little bit more so then you can send those seeds to other vaults around the world. Or you would just say, okay, you know what? Nothing special about the DNA here. Nothing special about the phenotype here. We're just gonna bag it, tag it, and maybe put um, a testing schedule on it for things like germination rates. And then if the germination rates begin to wane or decrease after six months, a year, whatever, then we would again do another cycle of grow and seed saving. So these seed vaults aren't a tag it and forget it. They are on a schedule to be regrown. So they are regrown on a set schedule because seeds do go they, they do die if they're left in dormancy for too long. So this idea that the seed vaults aren't doing this is incorrect. They have literal grow rooms on steroids in certain levels of their facilities. So just a side note there, they are growing indoors. They're not grown in greenhouses, but they're grown in basically walk-in freezers. And if I ever, if the university ever opens up again, my sister works there and I ask her at least once a month if the university, if you're allowed to get back into it, if you're not faculty or student, um, and she doesn't have an answer from me like yet, but once it does open, I'll maybe try to get you some like shots of what this stuff looks like, um, some of the science equipment that plant scientists and soil scientists use, but the freezer things are a thing. <laughs> if anyone, if there's any plant scientists out there or agronomists or anyone that's dealt with these, please back me up on this. They do exist, they're real. How can you save your seeds and what kind of seeds? Something you guys should know, there's these survival seed garden things, okay? They're gonna get a free plug. I have no affiliation with this company and quite frankly, they're probably all sold out because these seed survival seed gardens have been sold out for a long time, but there's a lot more coming up on the market. Now they provide you with a bunch of little baggies of seeds in this Mylar bag. These are all, uh, I think they're heirloom seeds, okay, non-GMO, non-hybrid. So some organic purists out there might have us believe that uh, only heirloom seeds will do and uh, nothing GMO. Obviously the GMO with the Terminator seeds, you don't want those because then you can't, you know, they're not going to actually produce seeds in the future. So you definitely... Okay, so survival seed kit, do not purchase that you will still have to know how to seed save. You cannot just store shit in Mylar bags and forget about it. The seed vaults, the seed vault guys don't even do that. It may seem like that's what they do, but they don't. They have active scientists growing. I've seen them do it. I've seen them do the germination test. I've seen their grow rooms. Um, so don't do that. That's a very poor choice. It's much cheaper for you just to learn how to garden and then save those seeds. And it's even more particularly true of a statement. If you grow seeds in your environment and then save the seeds that were grown in your environment, you will have seeds that already phenotypically survive better in your environment. So the Buy Survival Seed Garden packets, and I think he says on here that they're like 70 bucks, which is ridiculous. Um, if you grow though, if you get that and you choose to never grow them, you have phenotypically less 
versatile plants than your neighbor who's growing and saving seeds every single year because his seeds are slowly adapting and his plants are slowly adapting to the environment that they're grown in. So for example, if you have a drought year and you get seeds from that drought year. The seeds you save from your drought year are more, they're better equipped to survive in a drought. Whereas if you save seeds from a wet year, maybe the plain is flooded and your water table is really high, those seeds are more well adapted to surviving in a flood year. So, whereas the drought ones probably wouldn't do as well in a flood year. So you definitely want to plant those. The second thing he says about the GMO. So I am gonna get in trouble for this. I always get painted as this Monsanto sympathizer. I'm not a Monsanto sympathizer. I'm just a scientist, you guys, and it's just the way it goes, I'm sorry. But uh, GMO is not, you don't, there's this misconception where if you plant a GMO plant that the seeds from that cannot be replanted and yield a plant. That is not true. If you take a GMO plant and you save all the seeds from the GMO plant and you replant them in your environment in the next year, you seed save them just like anything else, it's gonna grow. It's gonna produce fruit. The fruit may not be phenotypically the same as the parent plant. It's still gonna be edible, it's still gonna be viable, and their offspring is still gonna be viable. The reason why I think that myth <laughs> came up is because these giant arsehole companies didn't want people replanting their genetically modified plants because they put so much money and so much research into making those crops. The best way to deter people from replanting them is just by saying, don't waste your time. They don't work anyways, when they actually do. So there's a farmer, I'm pretty sure in Saskatchewan, uh, where he was replanting, I wanna say it was Roundup Ready Canola, which is a genetically modified crop that you are not allowed to replant. You have to bring to the elevator and sell legally because it is a patented plant. And he was replanting this thing. Or was it? I think it was canola. Someone's gonna correct me in the comments down below. I know there's a movie out on him. But anyways, he ended up getting sued by Monsanto for this because he was growing, harvesting, saving, and replanting his Roundup Ready canola. And he just kept doing it over and over again. So it is completely possible to not only plant, but to germinate, then to flourish harvest from, seed save from, and eat ge genetically modified crops, and um, actually pet wave petunias and stuff like that, that's a GMO, just an FYI. Legally, you are not allowed to save the seeds from that and replant or sell them. Big no-no, technically speaking. So, common misconception, but completely false want that but hybrid seeds are like brains of, of different things theoretically anyways have taken the the best traits of, of one uh, line of tomatoes say and the best uh, traits of another and combine those and you get the best traits so you might get pest resistance uh, drought resistance blight resistance and so uh, from what I hear anyways hybrid isn't always bad but maybe you guys want to weigh in in the comment section below but it's a hybrids not bad hybrids normal that's what I used to do was hybrid breeding for wheat and yeah, you just select your phenotype that you want and then you breed according to that. And then you just like narrow it down over time. Important to remember that these survival seed gardens lack one thing, that is carbohydrates. This, the stuff in here, is going to provide you an ample amount of micronutrients. So your vitamin A, B, C, D, E, K, it's gonna provide all that for you. What it's not gonna provide is a lot of calories. Now, you may get some varieties of tomatoes in here. You may even get some watermelon, which will have some calories in it. You're gonna have some, some corn, which is going to be a, a great seed that you can stockpile, which is gonna be nutrient dense. Uh, another great seed that you could stockpile would be chickpeas. However, you, a lot of these things are gonna require that you live in the right plant hardiness. I'm gonna do a video on seeds to grow that are not a waste of your time because they actually yield a yield and can be used as a replacement for thing like chickpeas, for example. But I would stay away from chickpeas, flax, um, wheat. <laughs> the only reason I'm saying that 
because Kevin from Epic Gardening grew wheat the one year and the amount of wheat he grew, I mean, I'm from a farm, so he probably got like maybe two loaves of bread out of that. And then he's now growing flax, which adorable, but he said he planted them, like seed started the flax and then like transplanted them in the soil. Super cute too. But uh, those are like really low yields per plant. And that's why they're done on like an agricultural scale more so. Um, so those are ones I would avoid, but there's ways to get the benefits from those with other crops that are bountiful for us gardeners and aren't as time intensive as like a lawn of wheat or a lawn of flax. So I'm going to do a video series on that. It's coming. I did one so far of that series. So go check that out unless you have a greenhouse and a controlled environment to go in. If you don't know what plant hardiness zone you're in, go and check out this plant hardiness zone map that we'll post on the screen. That's going to determine what sort of plants you can easily grow. Now, I live probably more northerly than almost all of you. So, and I can tell you that we can pretty much grow almost anything here. We do live incredibly northerly and we can't just grow anything. If the world ended, Canadian prepper, I don't even know what his name is, but if the world ended, and we didn't all have solar panels like you. No one's growing tomatoes. I'm going to tell you that much. With the exception of citrus fruits, we have an incredible short growing season, however. So we need to get the seeds in the ground at a certain point. And there's a lot of different conditions. If not met, we, we will fail in our uh, trying to. And that's just another reason why you should not buy those survival kits. Because if you are in a colder zone, the growing degree days or the growing degree day units needed for the survival kit foods are very unlikely to suit your environment. So if you're a Canadian or if you are a cold climate grower, you want to look for the variety of any seed with the lowest number of days to harvest, the lowest. This will give you two things. First off, it's going to give you at least one guaranteed harvest. Secondly, it may, depending on where you are, give you a second run at growing. So go for the lowest number of growing degree day units. Grow those things. But one thing to keep in mind is that you want calorie dense stuff. So these are kind of deceptive. A lot of people buy this, they put it in the closet and they think, ha, ah, you know, I'm good now. I, I, you know, if the shit hits the fan, I'll be able to grow some seeds. I'll have an infinite supply of food. But they forget that this is not calorie dense stuff with the exception of the corn. You want things like corns, grains, even beans uh, have a lot of uh, calories in them. You want calorie dense foods. Potatoes are the best food, but for those... Beets, carrots, root veggies, turnips, all that sort of stuff has really high calories in it. Lots of sugar. You kind of always have to have them on deck. The best you're going to be able to keep them is probably one season to the next six to eight months from what I hear. Maybe if you guys have some advice on how to keep your uh, potato seed longer. That vermiculite. Cover them in vermiculite. You will be made in the shade. It will be a, a great uh, topic in and of itself because spuds are the number one survival food. They're going to provide you the bulkier calories. And if you mix and match them with something like this, you pretty much have it made. You get a few chickens in your yard and you hunt the odd deer, you're pretty much good to go. The odd deer, I should say, which will probably be driven to extinction, at least within your immediate era, shortly after. Canadian prepper, we don't want to eat our deer in our area because they all have the crazy deer disease. I can't remember what it's called. What is, I tried rescuing a baby deer and the conservation officer was like, just let it die because your area is just ravaged with this horrible disease. Apparently, they're all zombie deer around Saskatoon and area. For the shizzy hits the fizzy. Now, what else do we got in here in terms of seeds? We got some zucchini, we got some tomato, uh, most of the stuff we're going to grow this year. We got some carrots. We got some red pepper, cucumber, some string beans. We got some squash. Squash is great. Lots of calories in there. Yeah. So he just goes on about how to then store these properly for long term and like a prepper by desk about it, uh, which is fine. But the freezer method would work. It does work actually very nicely. Um, just keep in mind that moisture is a huge factor in that. And whenever possible, I mean, if the grid did go down, you're still not gonna have your freezer. You're still gonna have to figure out pretty darn fast how to seed save. 
whether you're in an apartment or not. So I would encourage you to start a, in a community garden, um, go to your local city, ask them to start a garden in your park. So I actually looked into this in Saskatoon because I was just wondering like what the options were available to people. And Saskatoon has a garden program where you can actually talk to the city about rototilling a space in your park, for example, and then um, endless amounts of donations to help with this. I was looking more so to like helping teach in these, like volunteering my time to help people grow. I didn't get an answer back from them. But anyways, that was more of what I was going for there. But in that, when I was like looking through all their information and stuff, that was one of the things I did stumble upon. So I would urge you to do that, figure out how to seed save properly, make sure your seed saving techniques work. It's not just simply scooping the seeds out and putting them in a bag and waiting till next year. There could be fermentation involved in the case of tomato seeds. There could be some sort of stratification that needs to take place for things like bulbs. There could be some levels of vernalization that you may need. It's not as simple as what you may think if you're not a gardener per se, but yeah. Anyways, I wanna thank you guys so much for enjoying this video or watching this video. Be sure to check out Canadian Prepper's entire video because I did not put it all up on this. I have to leave a little tantalizer out there for you guys to go check him out. I have to let you at least support my fellow Saskatchewanian here um, in the area. So I wanna thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to give it a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button, let me know in the comments down below what you want to see next. I will talk to you guys next time. Bye.